good evening and uh, thanks dr radhakrishnan for this kind invite so we will go through the basics of uh, mrcp or magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography we'll go through a few techniques we'll see a few cases and we'll see where it finds its use and particularly for the surgeon and we'll give an overview of uh, the various abnormalities and how as a radiologist we go through the images and how we reach a final diagnosis so let, there might be a little bit of technical jargon. I try to avoid that, but that, that's important in understanding how we get the images. So let's start off with some fun stuff. Like this is how a radiologist day looks like. So the, most of the time we spend hours in front of the monitor. So certain times like, and I wish all our surgeon, surgical colleagues do drop into the radiology department before your surgery, uh, have a discussion with the radiologist. It's much, much better. It gives you a much better perspective of what we are, whatever we see in the report, it's like little, we have to be concise, but then when you drop into the radiology department, you see it, the images in a much deeper, different perspective. But then certain times we are in a bad mood, so try to avoid these hours to come in for a discussion. But you're always, any surgical colleague and any clinical colleague is always welcome to the radiology department really changes the perspective of your patient, the case. Okay, with that, we'll start off. So most of you are aware of what MRCP is, and it has really changed the way we look at as an alternative to ERCP, which is much more invasive. So where do you find the uses mostly? It's like in evaluation of gallstones. So whenever there's an obstruction to see whether it's a malignant or benign obstruction, or when there has been a prior surgery, if you can see like any waters of surgery done, there is post-surgical alterations. And then in congenital abnormalities, where you have several pancreatic biliary abnormalities, the ducts have various variants. So you can look at that before the surgery. So what is basically MRCP? Uh, if I can a little bit go on what is called I feel like at this time, many people would be conversant with what T2 is. T2 is something, a sequence in MR where fluid appears very bright. So what we use is, because of the high content of water in bile, we use this technique, we exploit this technique, and we sort of highlight the tissues or the structures which contain plenty of water. So if you see the MRCP, you see most of the other structures are sort of blended in the background, or we are not that visible. So we have a way, it's called a heavily T2 weighted. So it appears rather much more brighter than the regular T2. So that is the key intent of, and now the background of how an MRCP technique works. So how do we prepare the patient? We tell the patient to fast for three to six hours. Why do we do that? So because we don't want fluid in the stomach and bubble, which sort of overlap with the uh, biliary radicals and the pancreas. So we don't want that. And also to reduce the urinal peristalsis, which may uh, cause artifacts, and also to promote gallbladder filling. So once the, uh, there's fasting, the gallbladder is well, well distended with bile. That is what we want so that it shows well on the MR. So there are several techniques. I will go to a little bit because of it's, the understanding is key to how we get the images and how you are seeing it on, on the films or on your monitors. So we have used a 2D or a 3D. And nowadays we have a very good 3D sequence, which is uh, we have it's isotropic. So you can reconstruct in whatever plane you want. So when you're applying this knowledge in your surgery, it's going to help you in the approach. And also you'll see the finer details in exquisite detail. So it has a very high spatial resolution because of almost there's no gap between the sections. So you have a good 3D model. So this is the current choice of technique, though we use the 2D as well as the 3D techniques. So this is a little technical. So what we have is like, uh, if we, and we need to have a respiratory trigger and patient needs to hold the breath. Uh, so that that is all little technical. So we use what's called thick slabs. Thick slabs, the area of interest. So we get a real 3D volume of tissue. So how do we plan it? We have the 3D technique, which is initially, if we have an acquired initial axial T2, which is aligned to the common bile duct and the head of pancreas. And the second, which is aligned to the pancreatic duct at approximately 90 degree to the first imaging plane. So you have something like two perpendicular angles. And then we have a respiratory trigger whereby the image acquisition is triggered when the patient holds breath so that we avoid as well as possible any breath hold artifacts. 
this. So let me play this video. So this is how a probably the initial set of images when we, which, which would not look that good, but this is how the initial set of images when there's a 3D acquisition, this is how the image looks like. So what we see here is, I'll run you through this. We are coming from anterior to posterior. So you might see a little bit of artifacts because of the bubble. So what we see here is the gallbladder, go back. And, and then we have the, as we come posteriorly, we have the common bile duct, common bile duct and the right and left hepatic ducts. And you're seeing some filling defects in the distal uh, common bile duct, which are calculi. And also you're seeing some bright, sorry, So what we have here is the common bile duct, and then you're having calculi here, and this hyper intense signal or call, but something which is bright is the pancreatic duct. So here you see the branching very well. You can see the branching, and you can see the first level of branches, and usually normally, uh, but if it's distended or obstructed, you can see the other ducts. So as we go posteriorly, any fluid containing structure. So here you have the spinal cord. So even that appears bright, while the rest of the uh, tissues are sort of suppressed and you don't get any signal. So this is the very good advantage. You are focusing on the area of interest. So this is like the, usually the MRCP sequences take considerable time and then we spend around half an hour. But the newer scanners, which is something, have a very fast imaging technique. So which is called some, it's called compressed sense imaging. So what used to take around like, you know, six minutes is this, this, it took around 3.3 minutes. We are finishing it in a few seconds. So this MRCP sequence took just 17.7 seconds. And this T2 axle and the coronal images took around just 19.3. So it was like, uh, we are so fast. And so the, the chance of, and you see the quality of images is it's, it's exquisite. So there is a big advantage in MRCP. We have developed this faster sequences. So even the even if the patient is sick, cannot hold breath, we have good sequences to overcome these difficulties. So in addition to these sequences, we usually do a T1 weighted, a regular T2 weighted, and a diffusion and a dynamic post contrast. Depends on the case. And then let me just touch upon something called functional MRCP. So this is based on the excretion of gadolinium contrast which usually has both renal and hepatic excretion. The contrast is also excreted by the biliary system, but certain agents are very specific for the biliary uh, radicals. So especially it's something called gadoxetate sodium, which is called EOS is the trade name. So these accumulate within the hepatocytes and then excreted into the biliary system. So it gives a contrast enhanced depiction of the biliary tree. So this is called a function. So in which case you assess the function of the biliary tree as well, how much of function is remaining is it still like uh, uh, how much of obstruction, how much of function versus? So, and the other technique is something called secreting, simulate, sec secreting stimulated MRCP. So, in this case, this is predominantly for investigation of pan pancreatic duct uh, by distending its caliber. When you inject secreting, pancreatic juice flows out into the duodenum. So, you have a thick slab. And it's like, it's like a dynamic scan, which is done at three, five, seven, and nine minutes following injection. And which time the pancreatic starts secreting the pancreatic enzymes. And by 10 minutes, the caliber should return to baseline. So if there is a persistent dilatation, it's considered abnormal. So what are the indications of this MRCP slightly different? So it's like mainly to identify pancreatic ductal abnormalities and structures, integrity of the pancreatic duct if somebody had a trauma before, and characterization of any communication, suppose you have a pancreatic pseudocyst, uh, post pancreatitis, so if there's a communication between the pancreatic duct and assessment of a, it's an assessment of the pancreatic function as well, and any premature of OD dysfunction. So these are the various other techniques in addition to the plain MRCP, which help in uh, identifying pathology. So this is just a uh, pictorial representation of how the uh, biliary system looks like. So when we Get to the uh, MRCP image. Let me just go through this, like I showed you in the previous. This is a it's called an MIP image called maximum intensity projection. So you have the gallbladder, and then you have to see the cystic duct draining into the uh, common bile duct, and then you're having the right and left hepatic ducts, and you're seeing the first generation of the uh, biliary radicals. 
and then you see the pancreatic duct and you, here it will be like the uh, ampulla and the sphincter of OD. So the basic thing is whenever there is fluid, it sort of appears bright on this particular sequence. So you're seeing fluid in the cilum, the duodenum, you might see fluid in the stomach. So that is where we ask the patients, if you, you want to restrict the amount of fluid, you get a complete detail of the biliary anatomy. So this is another video. So we have the uh, ability to project these in different angles. So when you come down to the radiology department, you have the, uh, sorry, you have the uh, luxury of going through these images, uh, which is actually helps in planning and getting a better orientation of what the abnormalities are. So rather than just seeing them on the films alone, so what do you see on the normal, if the patient has a very normal uh, MRCP, you just see uh, the normal CBD up to 7 mm is considered like usually, but then up to 10 mm may be considered depending on the age. And extrahepatic biliary duct should not exceed 7 mm. And the cent only the central intrahepatic biliary ducts are seen usually up to around 3 mm in diameter. And uh, again, you see the pancreatic duct is around 3 mm. So then you look at how do you go about start reporting. Once you get obtained the images, you how do you start? So you look about for any variance which you need to put in your report. So the surgeon will be very keen on because he doesn't want to alter the anatomy. So look at the main pancreatic duct. Most of the time, it drains into the major duodenal papilla along with the CBD. But sometimes you have an accessory duct of Santorini which drains into minor duodenal papilla. And then the cystic duct. The cystic duct has numerous variations, as you all know. It can join the extrahepatic duct, usually in the right lateral aspect, but it may insert in several other areas. So you have to look at that. Where is this? And mention that the radiologist should mention that in the report. It might be anterior or posterior or along the medial aspect. So a normal biliary anatomy is present in only about 60% of the population. So it can have, and then the cystic duct by itself can have a low insertion, like we said, a medial insertion, and can even drain into the right hepatic duct. So once we get the images, we go through the quality of the images, assess the quality, and then the first step we do, in spite of any other pathology, is to mention about the variance. So if you have it here, you have a variant where the cystic is the gallbladder, is the common bile duct, and then you see the cystic duct traversing across the common bile duct and getting inserted into the uh, common bile duct. And incidentally, this patient has a pancreatic pseudocyst, which also appears bright because it is fluid filled. And then this is the normal pancreatic duct. And this again is the serial of the duodenum. So this is another case where this is a variant and you have the gallbladder, this is the duodenum, this is the stomach, and this is a pancreatic duct, and again the CBD. But what you see here is a minor accessory pancreatic duct, which is sort of draining into the major papilla. So there's that these variations, anatomical variations, are what we look at predominantly. We have to pick this up and tell the surgeon. And this is a case of pancreatic device divisum, where you have the main pancreatic duct draining the body, neck, and tail, but this drains into the minor papilla. And then you have a smaller duct here, which is actually draining things, uncinate process and head, which is draining into the major papilla. So the, along with the CBD. So it's another entire variant, which MRCP can pick up all these variants with very good efficiency and a good specificity. Most of the time, the surgeons ask the requests coming for uh, cholelithiasis to see if there's a the calculi, whether it's gone into the CBD and if there is an inflammation of the gallbladder. So usually it's like 10% of the general population may have gallstones. So what are the types of gallstones? Like most of the time we come across cholesterol gallstone unless the patient has a hemolytic anemia or something. So cholesterol gallstones have typically very low sickle density on both T1. On T1 weighted images, you may not even see the calculus. On T2, they appear as filling defects. In olden times, when you have the oral cholecystogram, we used to call them as filling defects. So on T2, we call them as hypointense because as calcium, and cholesterol to calcium, but they have a lot of calcium, so do not have any signal on MR. While on the other hand, pigment stones can appear hyperintense on T1. So that's how you differentiate between the, because you have metal ions. So differentiate between cholesterol, up to a point you can differentiate between cholesterol and pigment stones. So this is a classic example where you see, a, this is called, it's a T2 weighted image, and you're having a well-defined calculus 
inside the gallbladder, you also have a lot of sludge. So and also like micro calculi. All these are like micro calculi, which might form the nidus for later calculi development. Can you see horizontal fluid level? This is the true cellular density of the bile, but when you see here, it's a little grayish. So it's like a lot of sludge within the gallbladder. And probably it's quite over distended. Maybe there's some obstruction in distance. And let me show you this uh, video where we have calculi. Uh, in this case, you have a lot of calculi. So here we have calculi in the gallbladder, all these hypointense nodules like uh, foci or, or calculi. And then what is happening in the CBD is something very funny. So you have a very distended CBD with again multiple calculi, which again appear hypoentins. It's all throughout. You have sort of the calculi are stacked up one upon each other. So this was a type of a colitocal cyst. And it's a young patient, colitocal cyst with multiple calculi. So we can find out those abnormalities also with, uh, so most of the time, it's the primary evaluation of calculi is where the MRCP is asked for. Similarly, another leg you have, so look out for filling defects. So filling defects are most, most often represent calculi, but I'll come to the pitfalls where we can make mistakes. So I, like I said, like it's called microlithiasis in the first case, like biliary sludge or microlithiasis. This is the sludge which appears gray, and this is the microlithiasis, the two tiny calculi which later on form an itis and grow into larger calculi. These are less than 2 mm, and usually again, they are hypointense on T2. So what happens, uh, and then most of the time, any calculi in the gallbladder, you have a propensity for having calculi in the common bile, like, like I showed you in the colloidal cyst. So MRCP also has a very high sensitivity and specificity because these calculi in the, in the uh, bile ducts. So it is comparable to ERCP and even for stones, less than around small than 5 mm. So what happens in cholecystitis? In cholecystitis, we have very thick walls. So again, that is again, MRCP is useful for diagnosing cholecystitis. So when you have calculi with thickened walls, it's called a calculus cholecystitis. And sometimes it's a very plain, you don't see any calculi, you just see a wall which is thickened. We call it a calculus cholecystitis. So any pathology connected with the gallbladder, calculus pathology is picked up very well by MRCP. But then it has a share of uh, pitfalls and artifacts. Many of these uh, causes can mimic calculi. So the radiologist should be very conversant. And the surgeon also should give him the necessary information. Like say, I've done a stent. I've done a uh, stent there. I've done a cholecystitis some time back. So if this information is available to the radiologist, it makes things easier for the radiologist to make a diagnosis. So when, when the, what we do is when we have an artifact, we sort of reassess the fast pin echo. We have a data set of regular T2 images or a T1 and the contrast, we go through those, see if these are evident on those. So, and then we come to a final diagnosis. So what are the other causes most common, like what we see is flow voids from arteries, which can compress on the biliary uh, tree. And others are pneumopenia post-op, debris, mucin, hemorrhage, and even tumors. Tiny tumors can mimic bone stones. So I'll just go run you through similar, like, uh, some sort of artifacts. Here in this case, we think there's a sort of uh, filling defect, but then this was due to a pulsation artifact from the hepatic artery, one of the branches of the hepatic artery. In this case, we see a air fluid level, air and uh, fluid level in the common bile duct. And then this you feel, but if you see carefully, uh, the intensity is much different than of a calculus, but this was due to a flow artifact because of the uh, which we see on, uh, if there's a rapid flow, you might see a, a filling defect in the uh, bite, uh, in the biliary radicle. And again, this is pneumophilia uh, in the, uh, on the MR, and, and the CT, which more, uh, most people are conversant, you see it as a filling, like uh, high port dense areas, which is similar to air, like air pockets. This again was a, a clip, surgical clip, or from a previous surgery, this can also appear hypointense. So the radiologist should not call this as a calculus, which can have other repercussions. So what are other uses in addition to uh, gallstones? Like where else do the, does the surgeon or request for a MRCP? So when you, it helps in differentiating between benign and 
malignant structures. What happens in a benign structure? So you, you see a lot of gallbladders there, you have some sludge, there is a dilated proximal CBD. The distal CBD appears normal, and then you have a very short segment structure which has very smooth margins and there's a symmetrical narrowing. And uh, so that sort of indicates that uh, which is more tending towards a benign structure. And then you have sclerosing cholangitis where you have a lot of changes in the biliary duct, you have branch duct abnormalities and uh, sort of uh, dilatation and strictures with like a beaded appearance. So all the uh, tracks up here have a beaded appearance. So this is more indicative of sclerosing cholangitis. And next is malignancy. So what do we have, does MRCP have a role in malignancy? Yes, of course, cholangiocarcinoma is one of the, you can identify where the lesion is, you can, you have the different types of the uh, uh, tumor, like a periductal type, which it might be a biliary structure involving the CBD, the common bile duct or the biliary bifurcation or intrahepatic duct. And sometimes what happens? What do we see on MR? We see increased wall thickness of the ducts, more than 3 mm, increased signal on T2. And then when we give dynamic contrast, what happens is this is more like cholangic carcinomas do not usually have induce a fibrosis and a fibrotic reaction around the walls. So what happens in contrast is there will be gradual enhancement. The initial phase, there won't be much of an enhancement as you wait and the dynamic later dynamic phases, the tumor sort of, you have an enhancement along the walls of the uh, tumor. And what happens if it is like, a, if, you, if it manifests as a stricture, it will have an irregular margin and very asymmetric in comparison to the benign stricture we saw earlier. So this would be the typical periductal infiltrating type. You have intraductal and mass forming types. So we need to, on MRCP, but in addition to MRCP, we would be doing the regular sequences for the uh, liver and bilic tract, which, which helps us to identify such tumors. So in this case, it's like you see a very high point. This is a periductal type. So it's growing, creeping along the vest, along the ducts. So you have a sort of uh, hypo intensity along the walls. So most of them get confined to the walls and do not become intraluminal. This, in the other, on the other hand, is a very clearly defined, it's like intraluminal. So it's, it's within just proximal CBD, you have an intraluminal mass. And then you have the very classic mass forming, where it is like, there's no identity, you don't know whether it's arising from the seed, like a, uh, any of the particular bigger radicals. So it's like a very ill-defined mass and shows a very poor late enhancement in comparison. So in this case, we might miss it for, mistake it for a hepatoma, but then in this case, the enhancement appears very late. So that sort of helps us to diagnose it, it less than a less chance for a hepatoma and more chance of a cholangiocarcinoma. The other diagnosis like periampillary, so where you have a dilated CPD and intrahepatic bleed radicals where the pancreatic duct is normal. So you have to suspect a periampillary carcinoma. And then in pancreatic carcinoma, very classic since olden days, you have the double duct sign well demonstrated on the MRCP. What happens in chronic pancreatitis? So chronic pancreatitis, you get a lot of stricturing and then you have this branch ducts. The branch ducts also appear very irregular. You have narrowing and you might pick up calcification. And here you see a very, like again, a calculus within the pancreatic duct. So the duct is also dilated. So this, in addition to your other sequences, would help in diagnosis of a chronic pancreatitis. Coming to intraluminal like mucinous neoplasms. Mucinous neoplasms contain a lot of fluid. So they appear very bright on uh, MR, like T2 weighted sequences. This helps. So this is again, like you have a typically called a cluster of grapes uh, appearance. So uh, on the regular T2 images. So that again, MRCP has a good specificity for diagnosing intraductal mucinous neoplasms. Congenital abnormalities, like uh, if anybody could guess, this is like a starry sky. So it's like, it's something called Carolis disease. So where there's congenital dilatation of biliary radicals. So all these biliary radicals are come out to form a uh, lot of appear bright on T2. And then the congenital uh, conditions like a, a polydocal cyst, which we saw and well demonstrated on the MRC. And then uh, let me, so this was the same. This was the same patient which we saw earlier, where it's a cholecystic cyst with calculi. So I think uh, we can come to the end. Let me stop with this. Uh, if we found this like sort of a smiling kidney here, and sort of we published it in uh, 
one of the journals in radiology. So called it a, you can see two eyes, some sort of fun aspect. Thanks for your patient listening. Thank, thanks, uh, Ravikant, for such a uh, short and sweet lecture and uh, just uh, taking us over uh, through MRCP. Um, uh, there are about 93 people watching in uh, this. Uh, um, That's good. That's wonderful. And there are about 44 in uh, Facebook. So about 130 people. Okay. Uh, any questions on the audience? Dr. Sudarshan, uh, what is your question? Hello, am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Sudarshan from Medanta Hospital, uh, Gurugram. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, what is the difference between CT cholangiography and uh, MR cholangiography and whether uh, in future CT a good CT cholangiography will replace uh, MR cholangiography? Uh, I, I don't think so because the uh, demonstration of the duct system is much whatever uh, and it's like non-invasive so and now with this faster sequences we are finishing off the scan within probably next the newer scanners we take hardly five to six minutes for the scan so you give such exquisite detail and so much of soft tissue contrast which lacks on ct and again you are like you're doing a ct cholangiography you need to inject contrast so which is becomes an invasive procedure and with its attendant complications and cholangitis so i don't think ct is going to replace mr Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions in the chat box. Sure. Uh, sure. Yes, in anybody? Okay. The first question is, what is the purpose of giving MRCP images rotated with different angles? Because rotated images don't give me much anatomical orientation. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Uh, you wouldn't understand it unless you sit with the radiologist come down to the radiology room and you then it, it makes you it makes it much more worthwhile you have a lot of understanding on that uh, how why a 3d why do we give that uh, like different aspects on a film it's not going to make any sense come down talk to the radiologist and he will or he or she will explain to you why we give that and when you see it real time on a dynamic view it makes a lot of sense yeah because possibly the a uh, person was uh, mm, expecting one single picture of you know conventional cholangiogram, pancreatic cholangiogram in the normal uh, textbook position. Okay, okay, but we have gone beyond that. So we we have a lot of information now. So we need to sort of utilize that information. When you have a 3D volume acquisition, there's a lot of planes. It's not just three planes. We can a lot of planes. Sometimes you might miss those findings on a regular plane. So it's better to include even a, a sagittal, oblique sagittal, where, which cannot be demonstrated on a film. And should be real time where you scroll, scroll through those images, you find you have more findings. So that is the uh, relevance of such. On a film, it doesn't, it's on a static image, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Dr. Reddy, what is your question? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, this is Dr. Jaipal from uh, Amrita Kochi, sir. Sir, in uh, usually the MRCP will we can see only the bile ducts, and when yes. we go IV contrast MRI, we can see all the arteries and veins. Is there any because we want to know the entire biliovascular anatomy? What is the relation of the posterior duct with the portal vein? And uh, so, is there any way like any softwares, anything available, sir, to see the entire thing in a single picture? The entire, entire thing is seen. That's why I told you, like in addition, whenever we do an MRCP, we just don't stop with this. We have I, I showed you some T2 weighted images, regular T2. We have a diffusion weighted image on teacher weighted images and if you have a fat suppressed sequence you can see the anatomy of the biliary radical and your portal vein branches in the hepatic arteries and once you do an arterial phase of the contrast you can see all the arteries and your anatomy in relation to the biliary uh, radicals so uh, the, uh, the software per se will be difficult for it to identify although ai is coming and segmentation is coming in but i think now which we have enough data uh, to help you with identifying all the branches. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question from Arvind Menon. Can you tell us something about uh, diffusion weighted images? What does it mean? Okay, diffusion, uh, let me put it in very brief. Uh, diffusion, I think we just go back to school days when we learned something called uh, Brownian movement. So Brownian moment where you have all these little molecules, like you put them in a box, it keeps moving them, moving in random directions. 
So what happens when you put this in a, uh, basically we are talking about protons. So like uh, the body is composed of water, so it's like protons. So when we use them in a particular angle, I put it very simply, it's a very layman language, and I'm not getting into the physics of it. What happens is the movement of the water particles becomes restricted in certain areas. Suppose you uh, you have a tumor or you have an infarct, in those areas, because of the edema, what happens, the movement of water particles is restricted. So in that case, what we see is there's an increase in signal, increase in which appears bright. And so that might will help the radiologist to tell you. And there are several other aspects uh, which help sort of differentiating from something which is a vascular event to something which is a malignant change. So diffusion is basically uh, based on the movement of water, water molecules. I'll put it as simple as that. I, does that address the, uh, uh, like, you know, the question or does he want some more clarification on something specific? Arvind, are you there? You are okay with that? I don't know. I can't see him. Uh, next question by Kislai Khan. How is abnormal pancreatic biliary ductal junction diagnosed? It's the same. Uh, it's the same, but it will be like... Uh, we can use the same sequences what we discussed now to uh, for any abnormal anatomical variance. We but it's not like only one sequence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, my question is regarding uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, Based yeah. on the location, whether it is distal, hilar, or intrahepatic, in which conditions we should prefer CT and which condition MRI with MRCT. Uh, well, uh, that's a difficult question. I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, it depends on. So it, it actually, uh, I would say MR is best because it, it, it you have more functional aspects. Functional aspects you don't get in CT, and sometimes the enhancement is on a CT would be very difficult to pick up. So in either, if whenever you're suspecting cholangiocarcinoma, ask for the uh, MR. It is going to give you much more information. Uh, than the CT. Ravikant, I often see a radiologist do a, a concurrent CT also, free of charge, of course, uh, to cross-check their findings. Isn't that true? It is true, but then it depends on your expertise level. So, so if you're confident on your MR, then I, I probably, uh, you wouldn't do a cross-modality investigation. So I, I would prefer a single, single, uh, modality and in such cases especially with the biliary uh, condition i would prefer an mr because it's like you get so much of anatomical information so much of functional information so i would stick to mr uh, in any case of cholangiocarcinoma also okay manigan prabhu you have a question no sir nothing sir there's nothing sir okay uh, there's another question sir uh, what is the difference between pneumobilia and calcula in cvd how do you differentiate in the CBD, well, uh, the shape, first of all, is the shape, uh, and you'll probably, if it's on a CBD, you'll have a fluid, like I showed one case, there'll be a fluid level, fluid and air level, which you will not get in a calculus. So that's the, uh, almost the most important clinching uh, pattern. You have a fluid uh, debris level, which you won't get in the uh, calculus. And then you will see, uh, if there is air in the CBD, you are probably going to see air even higher up within the biliary radicle. So that again adds to your uh, proof of air in the biliary system. Uh, do we ever use contrast dye in MRC? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, we do. It depends on, I think it's a radiologist decision. Suppose I'm dealing with a calculus, with an obstructive calculus, and I'm not suspecting anything else. I'm just seeing a calculus, the CBD, I have some calculus in the gallbladder. I don't see any inflammation in the gallbladder. I would stop at that. But if I am seeing something like a, probably you're looking at a uh, clad skin tumor, and which the uh, referring physician or a surgeon has not thought of, is that just, it's an obstruction, and I see that there's probably a tumor, then I would go in for a contrast. It depends on case by case. So I wouldn't do MRCT uh, contrast, like, you know, contrast for every patient who walks in. Okay, now, but I have seen some uh, MRCTs are perfect, picture perfect, while some, especially coming from outside, they're very hazy, uh, you know, there's no proper digital subtraction. Why is that the quality is very poor? 
quality is depends on the technique i say it's basically technique then the quality of the equipment and then the patient cooperation like that like i said uh, respirator breath hold is very important for mrcp acquisitions so if the patient is sick a lot of ascites is there or something like that or patient is obese cannot lie down supine for a long time is breathless then we might get very poor images so the newer scanners like i was saying when when you somebody even for us like to hold breath for 15 seconds too often within a period of 5 minutes is going to be difficult so now that we have cut down the scan time for a good quality 3d mrcp to around 2 2.5 minutes uh, it, it the images are going to be much better and you have much better quality so it's basically the several factors and then the technicians ability so there are a lot of factors that's why you're saying the quality of the hospital and the diagnostic center is different differs so when say if, if the uh, the technician or the radiologist in a diagnostic center takes uh, tender loving care then the outcome is better perfect yeah if I, I would always be at the console so if the radiologist is a console then things look things look better <laughs> Uh, the, the very commonly asked question somebody wants to know what information comes from T1 and what comes from T2. Uh, that's that's a very uh, T2. Let me put it very simply. T1 is uh, something, and you see the image. T1 is like you can look at any organ which contains water. Look at the spinal cord. When you see the abdomen, you see the spinal cord, spinal canal also. It appears hypointense, so it's black. Everything is uniformly black. And on T2, any fluid, regular T2 itself, anything containing fluid, it can be the bladder, it can be uh, the gallbladder, it is bright on T2. So uh, T1 helps, there are certain ways, like the fat appears much. So if you have a fat containing lesion, it's going to show up uh, more bright on T1. And if there's hemorrhage, subacute hemorrhage, suppose you have a clot in the urinary bladder, or there's a hematoma inside uh, your, inside, like intraperitoneal hematoma, like that's going to be, uh, you know, it's more conspicuous on T1. And that's just one of the, oh, I'm just giving an overview of what T1 can be used for. So Dr. Sudeep wants to know the lymph node characteristics in MRCP in malignancies. No, MRCP, I wouldn't use for uh, uh, lymph nodes at all. MRCP, uh, the, for the lymph nodes, I would use the technique called diffusion imaging. Uh, we have something called, it's a little technical, like you have something called B-values where we can clearly see and something called, there's a value called ABC, where we can tell that this lymph node is malignant in addition to the morphology of the size, the appearance on the other sequences, appearance on contrast, as well as then diffusion is most important in those conditions, like where you can tell more confidently that this lymph node is uh, more likely to be malignant. So I wouldn't use an MRCP to, MRCP really doesn't help, but other sequences help. Now, th there are uh, times when we do <clears throat> uh, MRCP for hepatopancreatic biliary pathology, not exclusively MR, uh, the MRI, without asking for MRCP. And there are times you want MRCP only. But with MRCP, you definitely give some MR pictures, which you don't see actually. You only look for that MRCP thing. Why is that? Is, there, is it any different when you do it for... It's a, it's a completely different technique. Uh, like I said, it's a completely different technique. I showed you the images where all other structures, only the fluid containing structures are highlighted. So all other structures, because we use a certain amount of, that's called a very heavily T2 weighted. We are interested only in the fluid containing structures. So only those will be seen. You may you will not see any other structures. So that's why people do not mention about other structures and on it. Just on it. Just if you ask for, for only MRCP, it's going to be a completely different technique. Dr. Abhay says, sir, can you please explain Tadani classification and MRCP picture he showed in slide? Yeah. Okay. Tadani classification is like, I think you need to look up that. I, that's not it's like MRCP is like the, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, it's basically how the dilatation of which area of the duct is involved. So if you have a, a, a extra hepatic, intrahepatic, and at what level is the dilatation? That is that is just the classification base. That's the Tordani classification. So that's about it. Like it's the same as uh, surgical or like even on the regular cholangiopancreatic. Um, how to differentiate liver metastasis and cholangiitis abscess in MR? 
liver metastasis uh, liver metastasis capsis uh on mr like on again like if you do contrast the the, the enhancement pattern of an abscess will be much different from the enhancement pattern of a metastasis and multiplicity and again uh, the enhancement and then you have because the abscess contains a lot of proteinaceous debris uh, you might even uh, get a uh, signal variations on different uh, uh, sequences so like it might appear a little bright on t1 like i said because you have protein and mucin and sometimes you might have a little bit of hemorrhage debris so and then the, there's a wall in the abscess like you have a very thick enhancing rim which usually is absent for metastasis most of metastases tend to enhance they have thin irregular walls and especially the adenocarcinoma metastasis and sometimes most of them enhance very homogeneously the neuroendocrine tumors on the other hand the whole of the lesion is going to light up uh, very bright on contrast imaging so and then you have like i said diffusion which again helps us to differentiate between an inflammatory pathology and a malignant pathology so we have a lot of repertoire of sequences which help us to uh, tell you very clearly that this is going to be inflammatory infective abscess and uh, because you have other findings also which on a t1 and a t2 you might see a layering uh, of debris uh, with uh, Uh, even air inside so this all help us to differentiate between a metastasis and a, uh, and a, and like an abscess so ragan you said that 6 hours fasting is enough right because quite often we see 4 uh, to 6 hours 4 uh, to 6 hours is fine often the, uh, we were asked uh, overnight fasting that is necessary i that is uh, that i feel is unnecessary especially with the diabetics it's going to be tough for them to you know uh, control their sugar so i would i would just recommend for what we need like as i told you is like reduce the amount of fluid in the stomach ask them not to drink any fluids during that time because if they distend the stomach it's going to create artifacts and you know uh, reduce reduce the diagnostic capabilities for us and then by the gallbladder is going to be distended quite well within 4 hours so 4 to 6 hours suppose you have an want to do an early morning uh, like so as the patient not skip his breakfast like you know 4 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock he can have an early morning meal and then by 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock we can get the scan done so i think 4 hours is more than enough that's a nice thing an unusual question yes i mean that is mra biliary system and mr cp the same it is it the is. same it's the same it's just the technical name we call it mr cholangiopancreatic okay thank you Yeah, Pramit. Uh, hello, sir. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Uh, just one question. In the case of Klaskin tumor, uh, do we need to get a CT angio with MRCP or MRCP with MR angiogram is enough, sir? Uh, but what are you, can I can I ask you? What are you looking at? What information do you want before your surgery? Uh, sir, before the surgery, we need to look at the relationship of the vascular structure, sir. For example, right hepatic artery to the bile duct, whether it is involved or not, anything like that. For that, uh, CT angio is better or MR angio is also okay? No, I would recommend a CT angio in that case because the uh, the hepatic artery branches. If you want to delineate mm-hmm. and if it's if you want to see if it's in in case, I would definitely recommend a CT angio, not MR angio, because you can okay. this, you can go wrong. Can these two <laughs> images can be sort of. Uh, Fused, you mean? Uh, fused and compared. Uh, it will be little tough because the the plane of uh, acquisition will be completely different. And on CT, you can go down to a 0.625 millimeter resolution, which is not possible on MR. On a regular T2, the maximum without much noise will be 3 mm. So technically, it is possible, but how much of information you cannot get the same slice at any point. So. it will be a little difficult but then you have to use your imagination to sort of you know uh, understand at what plane is the uh, artery and on the ct and on artery on the mr so it will be a little challenge but if you probably if you get a good uh, 3d still i would be hesitant to uh, use that you mean to go model in that case you can get uh, vessels alone i would stick to ct and to that okay sir you mean to say CT angio is the better one whenever we are contemplating any resection. Yeah, so first probably when you you have made a diagnosis, you ask for the MR to assess the biliary, uh, tree biliary structure and the extent of the tumor on the 
if it's a clad skin and how far is the extension of the skin much better on the MR. When you plan for your surgery, ask for a CT angiogram. That will give okay. you the, and the, the, the vessel layout much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the audience? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, many times there is a confusion in a dilated common bile duct and a fusiform kind of a polydocal cyst. So, any uh, sir, differentiating points, sir? Uh, it just the fusiform dilatation is like very classic for the uh, usually the CBD if it's dilated on its own it wouldn't be fusiform. The fusiform dilatation is quite classic for a polydocal cyst. That's the uh, most important differentiating feature. Okay. So the no more questions. Thanks, uh, Ravikan. Thank you so much for your thank time. You. Thank you. Thank See you. you soon. Another See talk. You thank you. Thanks. Bye.